And we're back. This is Monsters and Hamsters on WOOL-FM. And we've got a professor of physics and sustainability from Linden State College on the phone, Ben Luce. He's a renewable energy expert. Going to talk about Ridgetop Wind and some other stuff. Hey, Good ben. evening, Mark. Thanks for being with us. You're going to be talking at the Grafton Inn Friday, January 15th. Coming up, it's going to be at 630, discussing the environmental and social impacts of Vermont's energy plan and more effective renewables development than ridgetop wind, which you're not a, you're not for in Vermont. <laughs> that, that's, that's correct. That's correct. Why is that? Well, um, there's a whole host of reasons, but um, I think I could summarize it by saying that when I look at the resource potentials for wind in the Northeast, which is mainly limited to ridgelines, and when I look at how much of that resource is there and um, what the demands are for electricity in the Northeast. And also when I look at the impacts of that kind of development and the alternatives that are available to that kind of development, uh, it just doesn't make any sense to me. There's really not much resource relative to load. The impacts are very high and we have very, very good alternatives. No, you're a you're a science guy. You're approaching this dispassionately rather than from a, an emotional standpoint. Am I getting that right? That's that's correct. Yeah, you know, I, I certainly feel strongly about the impact issues. I, I have a strong love for the environment in this region, um, but there are always compromises in life, and I'm I'm open to looking at those. and uh, And I fully expected to be supportive of of some extent of ridgeline wind when I first uh, moved back to the Northeast about um, eight or nine years ago. And when I started to do the analysis on it, it just didn't, it just didn't make sense to me. And you're the former head of alternative energy at Los Alamos National Lab down in New Mexico. You've worked with nonprofits to get approval for things like big wind. Is that right? Yes. In fact, I was the utility scale wind champion in New Mexico for a decade. Uh, and I put every ounce of energy I had into getting laws passed and getting projects of that that kind started in that region. Um, so and it really did make sense to me in, in that place. The public is invited to attend this. Uh, I know there are people on both sides of this issue. And there's going to be refreshments, if that makes a difference. <laughs> Grafton in Friday, January 15th, 630. The talk is sponsored by the Grafton Woodlands Group. And they, if you go to their website, it kind of resolves to graftonwindomwind.org. They are a pack, and they are against the the wind, ridgetop wind as well. Just so nobody's caught by surprise, um, I wanted to say that. Uh, what what are your what are your thoughts about how this was introduced, the politics and the business behind it, and the response from the community? Well, I think in the in the state as a whole, um, we have a, a public here that is very supportive of renewable energy and is very concerned about environmental issues such as climate change, primarily climate change in this, in, with respect to this, uh, this topic. And I think there's a lot of really genuine support for, for renewables development. And I think this is an, a fairly new technology. It's one that really just became uh, sort of viable at a massive scale, oh, really in the last 15 years. It's, it's, it's quite new. And like pretty much any new energy technology that's been introduced, there's usually a period of time when there's a great deal of enthusiasm for it, but not a lot of real hard knowledge about the particular technology. We've seen this before with the, uh, the big push for uh, lots of dams and hydropower early in the 20th century, um, nuclear power in the 1950s, and then now a variety of new uh, renewable energy sources. And um, I think that uh, a lot of well-meaning people jumped on the bandwagon for, for utility-scale wind in Vermont very quickly. And the industry really took advantage of that and really lobbied our legislators and pushed through a lot of policies and built up a policy structure that 
really fast tracks this technology, but with very little sort of quantitative analysis of whether this really made sense, very little really serious thought or concern for the true environmental impacts, and really no sort of rigorous and objective comparative analysis of how this particular technology stacked up and compared to other types of renewables technology. For it instance, just became kind of a free-for-all. What would you recommend as an alternative? Um, the only renewable energy source in the region for electricity generation in particular that could be done at a scale even remotely approaching the electrical load of the Northeast is, is solar power um, or possibly offshore wind, although I'm for technical reasons, I'm, I'm very skeptical of, of the viability of that. So it's pretty much limited to solar in this region. And the, the numbers are pretty staggering. The potential for wind power in this region, uh, even if you developed most of the high ridges in the entire northeast, you'd be looking at supplying a few percent of the electrical demand and maybe <laughs> maybe about a percent of the total energy demand, so very, very small. Whereas the solar energy potential is hundreds of times larger, and you really, you really could realistically power the Northeast with solar power. It would have to be done right, and it would be a big undertaking, mm -hmm. but, um, but it's doable. It's not really doable with wind. There are people who object to solar on aesthetic grounds, just like people who object to ridgetop wind on aesthetic grounds. Sure, sure. And um, I think aesthetics are actually very important. Um, they can often be a good guide to whether something is done carefully and well. With solar power, it's, the resource is pretty ubiquitous. It's, it's available, in other words, it's available just about everywhere. And that means that the the potential for citing it carefully and the flexibility you have in terms of citing it is is very large so in principle you can pick very carefully where you put it and how much of it you do and how you do it you don't have that flexibility with wind mm -hmm. i read an article somewhere that that raised some good points that i hadn't considered about access installation and maintenance for big wind versus solar which is small components in, in terms of um, you know physical access to the sites yeah the ins the installation initially the maintenance as blades need to be replaced etc the roads need to be straight and very good and right um, yeah with with ridgeline wind it's this is a big scale technology so you're looking at components that, you know, for example, with the towers, you're talking about things in the many tens or hundreds of tons of sort of weight. And so you need sort of industrial scale roads up, up on the ridges to get that stuff in there and to maintain it. You've got to be able to bring very large cranes up there. So it's not, uh, it's not a technology that you clear a small clearing in the woods and put this thing in and it kind of blends in with the environment. You you basically have to create a very large, impervious, supportive surface right down the ridge line, uh, which takes up a huge amount of area and a huge amount of roads interconnecting those areas that can, t that can carry very large trucks. And so there's often a tremendous amount of blasting and bulldozing, all kinds of changes to the watershed. Uh, the, the, the impacts are, are really big. I mean, basically, each wind turbine platform area, you could you could basically build a right aid there, <laughs> with a parking lot surrounding it, uh, and you, you're going to have an almost interstate highway like type of road uh, in terms of its strength and the amount of earth that has to be moved and other things connecting those things. So it, and so it's, uh, the access requirements are, are big. Uh, to try to compare apples to apples rather than small distributed PV, how how big would a PV farm have to be to equal the output of just one one of the big turbines? 
So um, both actually have pretty big gland area requirements. PV it typically takes about anywhere between 5 and 10 acres per megawatt. And so you're looking at something like, you know, 15 acres to equal a, a utility scale turbine. On the other hand, if you look at the area of the base around the turbine, the roads that go up to them, and also <laughs> if you look at the longer uh, extended impact of the turbine, it's much more visible, um, creates much more noise, uh, has much more impact on watershed and things like that. Mm -hmm. You could argue that from an apples to apples perspective, they both have pretty big uh, land area impact. The advantage of the solar is that you have tremendous flexibility on where you site it. And because of that, you don't have to necessarily do a great deal of bulldozing and blasting and whatnot. You can, you, you can break it up and be much more careful with where you put it. So it's, it's easier to put in the infrastructure for a PV farm, but it would be better to have rooftop solar? Well, rooftops will get us to a certain, you know, I think the estimates are, uh, um, the National Renewable Energy Lab estimates you could do about a, a gigawatt of, of rooftop solar in Vermont. And if we were really going to power the state with this, we'd probably need something upwards of five gigawatts, something like that. So rooftop, is uh, its potential is limited. Mm -hmm. If we really push the envelope on rooftop, uh, we might be able to do a bit more. That Those are fairly conservative sort of estimates. And in the, in the long run, as buildings evolve and people uh, make more and more roof space available and whatnot, um, the potential for rooftop could be significantly larger. And if the efficiency of PV ever doubles or triples, which, which it very well might, then rooftop could handle a much larger fraction of the load. My personal favorite kind of system, though, is not necessarily rooftop, but is the sort of pole-mounted, the, the small pole-mounted systems. So I, I like rooftop, but um, the, the pole-mounted systems have a lot more flexibility on siting, mm -hmm. and they also handle, they, uh, they can uh, handle snow much better. Maybe community solar is an answer? Yeah, um, I think, right, and there's sort of different scales of community solar. Community solar can range from a couple of pole-mounted arrays up to uh, big multi-megawatt scale type systems. But yeah, I think that in general, there's probably a need for uh, a range of different scale systems, and many of those ideally would be what, what people would term uh, a community scale solar. Is the real elephant in the room conservation, which we've proven as a country time, and again, we can't handle. I mean, efficiencies for appliances and gadgets keeps getting better, but we keep using more of them, and our aggregate use keeps going up. Well, the U.S. is the use in the U.S. has gone up, you know, uh, fairly steadily. But the the curve has been sort of bending over over the last thirty, forty years, and we have become increasingly efficient and are becoming more so. We're not. Conservation per se is not something Americans are very good at, no. but we are quite efficient in terms of the types of devices we use, and there's a lot of potential for improvements that way. My own view on this, though, is that um, it's, it has to be a blend of these things. We need conservation and we need efficiency uh, very much. They're, they're very helpful for kind of capping the total amount of demand. But realistically, I don't see that it's very realistic for the U.S. or for the world as a whole to go back to an F a level of energy usage that's a small fraction of what, what it currently is. So I personally believe that we really, we really have to fix the energy sources. We really have to transition to, to carbon-free energy sources fundamentally, and that sometimes efficiency and conservation can actually um, get in the way of that somewhat, because if people put that first, and if the change in the sources is deferred, 
then the result can be that we end up getting more efficient and some people end up becoming more cons- uh, or conserving more, but the total demand just keeps going up and the, and the, and the emissions will keep going up. So, for example, if, if people in the United States started using half as much oil tomorrow, this would potentially free up of that supply, that oil supply, to go somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Supply and demand dynamics might lead to low, lower oil prices, and consumption in other places might just rebound and go up. And, that, and the same amount of oil may, may very well end up getting burned, especially over the long term. So efficiency is not a means necessarily to reduce energy demand overall or even reduce emissions. It's really important that the, the sources of energy actually get cleaned up. Maybe what we need is a poorly conceived renewable energy credits program for individuals. <laughs> well, I'm not sure what you mean by poorly conceived. <laughs> I'm, I'm making things up. We don't have a very good renewable energy credits, or we haven't had a very good renewable energy credit system in Vermont in particular. I'm not sure if that's what you're referring to. but <laughs> It is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and we certainly have had a problem. The state is improving, but there's still some problems with that. Mm-hmm. For those listeners out there who aren't aware of it, Vermont was uh, allowing renewable energy credits to basically be counted twice. Utility companies were allowed to count renewable energy credits or count renewable energy generation from projects both towards the state targets and also to at the, at the same time sell the same renewable energy credits out of state. And I think this this dramatically distorted the pricing structure of renewable energy. It made wind power look a lot cheaper than it actually is and um, created basically a, a false impression to Vermonters that they were getting renewable energy when they really weren't. And it was just a, um, it, was, it was basically fraud. It mm-hmm. was double counting fraud. This finally got exposed, and other states started to cut off purchasing renewable energy credits from Vermont, so that forced the state to act. So that's been fixed, although I think we're still seeing a tremendous number of net metering projects, especially big solar projects, who are selling their credits out of state. So there's no requirement yet for those projects to necessarily retire their credits in state. And I think there's a significant number of people who uh, who still think they're getting renewable energy from those projects when the credits are actually being sold off. And so there's still some issues with the structure of that credits program and and with the with the honesty of that program. But resolutions are moving forward in in that, as in most things, apparently, regarding our energy production systems. The state did fix fix it to some extent. They they set a legitimate renewable energy target, a pretty high one, I think, ninety percent by twenty fifty, and with the requirement that renewable energy credits for those for those, for the new targets be legitimately uh, handled, basically not allowing double counting for that. But uh, it's still possible for credits for net metering projects to be sold out of state. And I think a lot of people that are uh, undertaking their own net metered projects for their businesses or for their homes, in some cases, don't understand that the credits are being sold off in many, in many cases. So there's still a, a kind of a, a subtle issue here of, of fraud, basically. We're talking to Ben Luce here on WOOL. This is Monsters and Hamsters. We're talking about, uh, well, we were talking about uh, Ridgetop Wind, which Ben is against. But I should point out, I think this is right. You're not against wind energy, and this isn't a NIMBY position that you're taking. Right. My own criteria for supporting wind projects are that they're cited very carefully to avoid a number of impacts, and one of them is uh, impacts to natural environment in terms of minimal bulldozing and blasting and things like that. They should be cited in places where they have genuine and strong local public support, and you can find places like that in Iowa, for example. And you have to be very careful about 
putting them too close to homes. I think the, the noise issue is, um, well, it may actually prove to be an Achilles heel for the wind industry in a big way <laughs> in mm -hmm. coming years. I think the, the, the realization that you have to keep these things pretty far from people's houses is, is, uh, starting, to, is starting to sink in. And you have to be careful about birds and bats and uh, uh, environmental impacts like that. And I think the, those issues, the, the industry tries to sweep those, in, those issues under the rug. But in fact, the potential impact on species such as raptors and bats, especially on ridgeline projects, is, um, is very, very serious. So th those issues have to be addressed I, uh, in, a, in a given project. And I think that when you sum up all those issues, it really limits the, the viable places you can put these things. And so I think all, uh, overall, um, wind energy might be a big, or, and can be a big contributor, say, in the Midwestern United States. But, mm -hmm. um, but I don't think it's appropriate in the Northeast. Yeah, that, that won't do Vermont any good, though. Wind farm in Iowa or Minnesota won't do Vermont any good, right? Right. Um, unless, yeah, unless it was, uh, you know, in, pr in principle, you could have a massive and newly upgraded electrical grid that would distribute wind in, um, energy throughout the United States from the Midwest. It's possible in principle, but I think that there's much more economic uh, alternatives to that. I think more local distributed solar power would be much, much more economic. Now, you spent... Uh 14 of your years at LANL in the theoretical physics division. You were a nonlinear dynamics guy, chaos theory. And, right, originally, yeah. And so the whole rapid climate change thing is something that you're well acquainted with and recognize the potential for. Does that trump anything? No, it actually, it actually energizes my point of view. Um, to me, I, I'm a very, to this day, I'm still a very strong believer that we're facing a huge crisis with, with global warming and climate change. I'm, I'm very worried. In fact, that's what spurred my whole interest in renewables to begin with. But it's because of that, it's, it's absolutely crucial that the solutions, whatever solutions we undertake, be really well chosen. They, they have to be solutions that are going, going to be really viable. And that means they're going to have to have, an, they, should ha they should be solutions that have enough resource potential to really do the job, minimal environmental impact if possible, uh, just for the sake of saving the environment here. They also should be as economic as possible, have as little impact on, negative impact on people as possible. And if they lack those kinds of attributes, they're likely to, engender a lot of political opposition in the long run and potentially undo the entire political support for renewables that currently exists. So <laughs> I see I see ridgeline wind development in in the northeast as um, as a as a huge threat to the viability of the whole renewable energy movement in the region. Mhm. Mm there are uh, anti-PV people that talk about the embodied energy and environmental cost of manufacture. I think that's been pretty well debunked, especially as uh, the ratings have gone up for the panels. How does that compare to the big mills? What's the life cycle of these things? Mm. Um, the, kind, the studies that I've read in the past suggest that PV modules pay themselves back energy-wise in a couple of years. So the, the energy, the embodied energy question is, is um, I think, a red herring. It, it probably was true in 1975 that a PV panel took more energy to manufacture than it produced uh, just because of the way things were at that time from a manufacturing standpoint. Um, I think today the embodied energy looks good. My biggest concern with PV manufacturing would be if it's done uh, recklessly with improper disposal of, of, of any chemical waste that might be associated with it or um, mining of materials, things like that. How does it stand up to the big windmills? I mean, they both use aluminum, but I imagine the big mills a lot more. Um, the, the 
big environmental costs embodied energy-wise for wind turbines are uh, steel production, um, potentially issues associated with mining on for magnets, uh, special materials, rare, rare earth and things like that, and cement production. Mm-hmm. Uh, the embodied energy of of utility scale wind, I think, is still it still looks pretty good. The, the, the studies I had read on that suggest it it does pay back pretty well. So I think it I think that issue is also uh, largely a red herring for wind. Although, if you I think in the long run, if you compare them, I think solar has some advantage this way uh, because it's such a low maintenance and long lived technology compared to maintaining wind projects, which are intrinsically a bit difficult. They're mechanical machines with lots of moving parts. And yeah. uh, I think the long term energy investment and just keeping them going is going to is, is going to become significant over a long period of time. So for, for people who want to attend the talk that you're going to be giving at the Grafton Inn Friday, uh, January 15th at 6.30, what can they expect? More of this? Yeah, I guess I've laid out some of my general point of view, but I'm going to show some of the numbers involved uh, much more thoroughly and um, people will be able to see visually a, uh, a lot more about what the real impacts are like. I'm going to provide a lot more uh, real hard information about, the, about, about all of these issues than I did here. Here we just don't have the time or capacity to right. convey all that. But, but in the talk, I, I will provide hopefully all of that very clearly. And the talk also will be providing your uh, suggestions for positive alternatives. Is that yeah, right? yeah, we'll look at solar, for example, pretty carefully. And I, and I do have cautions about solar. I'm very concerned that we don't make the same mistakes with solar that we're, I think we're making with wind. Um, so there's a potential to do that technology incorrectly as well. So I'm going to try to address how uh, sort of best practices, I think, for that as well. Okay, so so people that may be in favor of the, the ridgetop, they could benefit by going to this because you're going to present it dispassionately. That, that's, that's my intent, yes. And I, and I, I welcome people on, from both sides of the issue to come and talk and, you know, and, and ask questions and have discussion. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think it's, it, people get the most out of it when there's some genuine discussion and frank, open trading of viewpoints. So I hope people from both sides of the issue will come. Oh, me too. There's just way, way too little uh, restraint and civility and respect and thoughtfulness and transparency as well. <laughs> yes, I think that's the case. Is there anything else that uh, that we should cover that that needs to be said? Um, I I guess I would just urge people out there to to really try to. Uh, whatever opinions they might have at this point, really try to maybe pull back from the the really passionate views and try to look, really open themselves to a more quantitative and uh, comparative uh, approach to the whole issue. Because we really do need to find solutions to our energy situation, and um, we're not going to have a good outcome if we if we just get mired with lots mm-hmm. of controversy and we don't get down to the business of actually figuring out what's really going to work. I would hope that anybody on either side of that or any other issue gets out of being stuck in a confirmation bias mode. A, right. Yeah, I think you just said it, the confirmation bias phrase, I think, uh, captures the exactly the spirit of what we what we should try to transcend and anybody who might be listening if you're on if you're a proponent for ridgetop wind i invite you to to come on the show you can leave a message here at the station 802-460-9665 you can email the station feedback at blacksheepradio.org this is an important conversation and everybody needs to be heard and i want to know about your bs and sound recording Oh, <laughs> uh, 
I've, I've always thought the the acronym BS for a degree is a funny <laughs> is a funny acronym. Yeah, I started off life. Uh, my my dad was a synthesizer designer, so I no. had a lot of interest in music and um, and sound recording and playing in bands and things. And I, I'm still an act, pretty active uh, musician. And uh, my my first undergraduate degree was a four year degree in sound recording. Um, and then I at that point in the middle of that, I fell in love with physics and stayed a couple. Well, I stayed an extra year, and got a physics degree, and then went on to graduate school from there. And <laughs> there's a, a long-standing tradition of people who are kind of into physics on one hand and music on the other. I, I think there's something about uh, the patterns involved in both areas that appeal to certain people. Tell me a little bit more about your dad. <laughs> he w- he built the first truly polyphonic uh, analog synthesizer. No. Uh, it was called the Polymoog. He built it for Bob Moog back in the 70s. Oh, he was working out there in Ithaca? Yep, uh, <laughs> in, we're in western New York. And, um, yeah. Yeah, and uh, he also was a physicist as, as well, and he, he was one of the, he was actually the first person to really prove that different sounds really could be mapped onto particular waveforms. Um, he did some fundamental physics work in that, and then he went on to build the well, spent seven years in a garage building, inventing new circuits, and came up with the Polymoog. And now he um, designs those machines that uh, do that little air puff into your eye to measure the interocular pressure in your eye to check <laughs> for uh, potential glaucoma risk. So your whole family is all over the map, sounds like. <laughs> yeah, we are. <laughs> I have some... Um, some great pictures of him with his synthesizers back in those days and the long sideburns and <laughs> <laughs> well i uh, this this has been informative talk it's been fun in more than one ways especially these last couple of minutes for me <laughs> uh thank you thank you so much for taking the time um you're welcome mark my my pleasure and i look forward to meeting folks from from your area down there on, on next weekend Ben Luce. Am I pronouncing that right? Luce? I didn't even ask. Yep. No, that's fine. Yeah, that's right. uh, Friday, January 15th, Grafton Inn, 630. And he's uh, not for Ridgetop Wind, but he's got his reasons. It's a good summary. <laughs> All right. Have a, have a great night. You too. Thank yep. you. Bye-bye.